Chapter 18 is the chapter over the cardiovascular system that focuses on the heart. So when we talk about this cardiovascular system that begins and ends at the heart, the heart is actually a two-sided pump. The right side receives oxygen-poor blood from the tissues. It pumps the blood to the lungs to get rid of the CO2, pick up the oxygen by way of the pulmonary circuit. And the left side of the heart receives oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps the blood to body tissues via what we call the systemic circuit. So this is a look at the overall circulation to and from the heart. And if we start here at the left ventricle, you can see that blood is pumped through the aorta and it goes to the different branches that branch off the aorta to the capillary network and the systemic circulation. And these very small blood vessels actually feed the tissue cells and deliver oxygen to them and then pick up the waste product, the CO2, bringing that back through veins into the right atrium down to the right ventricle. And then you can see it's pumped out into what we call the pulmonary circuit to the capillaries in the lungs that actually directly connect with alveoli. And that's where the gas exchange occurs. CO2 is dropped off, oxygen is picked up and back through pulmonary veins to the um, to the left and to the left atrium and round and round. Okay, so that's that's two two different circuits: pulmonary circuit, systemic circuit. Now this is showing you this uh, position of the heart, and the heart is actually found in the mediastinum. It's a uh, cavity within the thoracic cavity. You can see here a cross-sectional view from the top showing you the position of the heart. It's tilted a little bit to the left so that it takes up or occupies part of this cavity that normally the, um, would be the left pleural space. So you can see that the room for the left lung is um, a little bit smaller than what you see here where the right lung is. Um, the base is at the top. The apex is at the bottom. The heart's about five inches long and about three and a half inches wide. And you can see how it's kind of tilted towards, the apex is tilted towards the left hip. And it's also tilted forward against the anterior thoracic cavity wall. So the point of maximum intensity, shown here as the PMI, is actually in the fifth intercostal space. And if you were to put your finger there, you could actually feel the heart beating in that fifth intercostal space. This is a cutaway section showing you from the anterior view the position of the heart. It's anchored um, here by coll collagen fibers to the superior aspect of the diaphragm. And you can see the major vessels coming out of the heart and how the pericardium, the pericardial sac, is actually attached by fibers to those larger vessels exiting from the top of the heart. So here is your superior vena cava, there's the aorta, and they're showing you the pulmonary trunk. And these small little flap-looking structures here are actually the atria, and then um, this is the ventricle here at the bottom. Now the heart is surrounded by what we call the pericardium. This is a double walled sac that surrounds the heart. The outer part of it is called the fibrous pericardium and that's fibrous connective tissue. It's very tough. It's not really expandable, but there is a considerable amount of fluid within the pericardium that allows the heart to expand. Now the fibrous pericardium, that really tough fibrous layer, has three functions. It's for protection, it anchors the heart, and it prevents it from overfilling. Underneath that ferrous, uh, fibrous pericardium is what we call the serous pericardium. That's the inner layer. And the outer layer, which underlies this fibrous pericardium, that layer is called the parietal layer. And then inside of that is the visceral layer. And in between these two layers is the fluid that's, um, that gives cushion and also helps to allow the heart to expand. That's in between. 
Now, the visceral layer of the serous per pericardium is also called the epicardium when you're talking about the layers of the heart wall. So there's two terms sometimes that are used. So visceral layer is um, considered the inner layer of the serous pericardium, but the term given to it when you're talking about the layers of the heart wall, the outer layer, is the epicardium. Same thing. Now, the parietal cavity or also called the pericardial cavity, is in between the visceral and parietal layers, and that's where your fluid is. And an inflammation of the pericardium, which sometimes is a secondary infection, secondary to pneumonia, because the lungs are really close by, and these infections can be transferred, or they can move from the lungs into the heart, that is uh, called pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium. So, Here's a look at a little piece, a cutaway section of the pericardial layers, layers of the heart wall, um, and it's showing you this fibrous pericardium, and here it is attached to the pulmonary trunk, and then underlying that layer, there's the parietal layer of the pericardium, there's the per pericardial cavity, and there's the epicardium that also is the same as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And then um, here's the layers of the heart wall. So epicardium, myocardium, which is just mostly heart muscle cells, and then the endocardium, and then the endocardium under that is your, your heart chamber. So pericarditis, which we mentioned a little bit earlier, is an inflammation of the pericardium. And those roughened membrane surfaces can result in a pericardial friction rub, which makes a creaking sound that can be heard when you um, are looking at a patient's or listening to a patient's heart sounds with a stethoscope. Now, the term cardiac tamponade refers to excessive fluid that sometimes builds up when you have pericarditis, which can compress the heart and limit its pumping ability because remember that fibrous pericardium on the outside is not able to expand it's very stiff so that can be a problem for people that have this type of infection there's your three layers of the heart wall epicardium myocardium endocardium and remember that the epicardium is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium now there are four chambers in the heart there are two superior atria those are the receiving chambers of the heart and each atrium has a protruding auricle. I'll show you that on a picture. Um, there's two inferior ventricles, and there's a septum in the middle that separates the two atria and ventricles. The one that separates the atria is called the interatrial septum, and there's a little depression in between uh, the two atrias in that, in, that septum, in that septum wall that's called the fossa ovalis and that's a remnant of the foramen oval of the fetal heart. The septum in between the ventricles is called the interventricular septum. This anterior view of the heart, this cutaway section, is really going to give you a lot of information. And I, um, in lab, you will focus on this a lot more. Um, the details of this picture are very important. And on page two of the notes, um, some of these more important structures are actually defined and mentioned there. But coming into the heart, I'm going to go through this picture with you, but coming into the heart, the superior and inferior vena cava, the superior vena cava bringing blood back from the upper part of the body, inferior vena cava bringing blood back from the, from the lower part of the body, come in together into the right atrium. And then you'll see here your pulmonary trunk is where blood is taken away from the right ventricle. Something interesting here to notice, the right ventricular wall is a lot smaller and not as thick as the left ventricular wall. When the heart pumps and when it contracts, blood that's in these two ventricles is going to be pumped up away from the heart through, pulmonary, through the pulmonary trunk, which is going to take blood to the lungs. And the left ventricle is going to pump blood into the aorta, which is going to take the blood to the, into the systemic circulation. So because the, left, the uh, left ventricle is carrying blood to the entire body, 
the muscle is a lot thicker, a lot stronger, and pumps with a lot greater pressure. Pressure coming out of the left ventricle is 120 over 80. When you talk about the blood pressure as the blood is being pumped from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, that pressure is considerably less, 24 to 25 over 8, because you're only pumping the blood next door to the lungs. So it doesn't have to be under as great a pressure, and therefore the muscle's a lot thinner. So back to our story here, right pulmonary artery, those vessels are the vessels that are going to be taking the blood from the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. And these are deoxygenated. Most arteries are oxygenated. This is an exception to the rule, but they are carrying blood away from the heart, which is usually what arteries do. Then the veins here, the pulmonary veins, are going to be bringing blood back into the heart from the lungs. They're veins, but they're oxygenated because they're um, they're oxygenated because they're returning from the lungs after they've picked up the oxygen. Um, right atrium over here. Right pulmonary veins we talked about, the fossa ovalis, there's that depression that um, exists between uh, in the interatrial um, wall. Pectinate muscle is the name of the muscle that makes up the inner structure of the atria. And uh, pectinate means comb-like, they kind of thready in appearance. The tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. There's your right ventricle. Chordae tendinae are the tendinous cords that anchor the valve flaps to elevations of muscle in the ventricular wall that are called papillary muscles. So you have papillary muscles here in the left ventricle and you also have them in the right. Um, trabeculae carniae is the name given to the appearance of the muscle in the inner wall of the ventricles. We said pectinate muscle was what you called the um, appearance of the muscle in the atrium. And then in the ventricle, it's called trabeculae carniae because it looks like a honeycomb-like appearance. And that's what the word, word trabeculae refers to as those little beams that we saw in spongy bone. Um, inferior vena cava, we mentioned, brings blood back from the lower part of the body. Here's your aorta exiting out the top of the heart. And just to um, address something that was mentioned on page one of the notes, these three vessels here that branch off from the top of the aortic arch, these are the brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid, and the subclavian arteries are the first branches off the heart that feed different structures in the systemic circulation. Um, left pulmonary artery we mentioned, left atrium, pulmonary veins we mentioned, the mitral valve is the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. These two valves here are what we call semilunar valves. Here's the aortic semilunar valve and there's the pulmonary semilunar valve. Um, left ventricle, papillary muscle, interventricular septum, and then last, the three layers of the heart wall, endocardium, myocardium, epicardium. This picture is a surface picture or view of the heart. Um, most of these structures we talked about already, but I just wanted to show you um, that this is, this is what an oracle is. It's a little scalloped appearance that you see when the atria um, are relaxed and the muscles contracted. It has this scalloped-like appearance. Now, heart valves ensure unidirectional flow of blood through the heart. So they open and close in response to pressure changes. The two atrioventricular valves those prevent backflow of blood into the atria when the ventricles contract. So you have the tricuspid valve, which is the right AV valve, and that one has three flaps. The mitral valve, or the bicuspid valve, or left AV valve, has two flaps, and that's on the left side of the heart. And remember that those tendinous cords, called the chordae tendinae, help to anchor those valve flaps to papillary muscles so it holds them from blowing back into the atria when the ventricles contract. And I'll show you a picture. From the top, if you cut away the top of the heart, you can see this picture here is showing you where they are, the four valves, it's kind of small. 
But when you look at the top view here, this is the mitral valve, two flaps. The valve flaps are, are pointing away from you. They're actually anchored behind the screen here. Um, your tricuspid valve has three flaps. And those two valves go between the atria and the ventricles. Now, this aortic valve here, three flaps, pulmon pulmonary valve here, those are the semilunar valves I talked about. They allow blood to come through the ventricles and into either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta when blood's ejected from the ventricles during ventricular contraction. So here is a look at um, the chordae tendinae. This is inside of a ventricle and showing you the papillary muscle that that valve flap um, is attached to. Showing you how the um, atrioventricular valves work, when blood comes into the atria by gravity, most of it's going to flow through those valve flaps down into the ventricles. Now the valve flaps are open, they're relaxed. And then when these lower chambers contract, then what happens to them is they move upwards and close off the atria so the blood doesn't flow backwards into the atria and it's forced through these um, semilunar valves. This one here is going to go into the pulmonary trunk, and then the one you can't see here behind is going to go into the aorta. But remember, the valve flaps, the atrioventricular valve flaps are held in place by these tendinous cords anchored to papillary muscles, so they don't blow back into the atria. Now, when you're talking about the semilunar uh, semi valves, what happens is during ventricular contraction, they flatten out and they open up and allow blood to go into the pulmonary trunk and blood to go into the aorta. And then by gravity, sometimes the blood's gonna to wanna to come back down, but those little cups will close off the middle and not allow the blood to flow back into um, the ventricles. Homeostatic imbalance of uh, heart valves and their functioning is you can have an incompetent valve and an incompetent valve is where the valve flaps are kind of stiff. They don't close properly. And so there's backflow of the blood and the heart's repumping the same blood over and over again. So this can be a real problematic with blood volume and stroke volume, uh, the amount of blood that's actually coming out of the heart. So stenosis, stiff and hardening valves, um, and you can sometimes hear a murmur um, because the blood gurgling back through the valve flaps can make another additional sound and you can pick that up with a stethoscope. Um, sometimes if the condition is very difficult and the valves aren't very flexible and the blood's having a hard time getting through and it really affects the volume of blood that's ejected, then sometimes a valve replacement is required. Now there is something called mitral valve prolapse, which is an insufficiency in which one or more uh, or both of the mitral valve cusps bulge into the atrium during ventricular contraction. It's hereditary and it affects about one in 40 people and primarily women tend to be affected by this. Um, so like I said, any type of faulty valve problem could be a condition that if it's severe enough, a valve replacement may be required. Now this is the pathway of blood through the heart. So this is really, really important. We talked about this early on in this, in this discussion when we looked at the systemic and pulmonary circulations, but just to, to go through it again, and it is on the bottom of page two of the notes, blood uh, goes from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary semilunar valve, you can see here. So right uh, atrium, right ventricle, through the valve, the tricuspid valve, and then um, through the seminary, I mean, I'm sorry, pulmonary semilunar valve, and then pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Okay, so you go through the pulmonary uh, capillaries, then you come back, you come back to the lungs by way of the pulmonary, I uh, mean from the lungs, pulmonary veins to the left atrium, and then through the 
bicuspid valve, also called the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta, and then to the systemic circulation. So that's the whole circulation through the heart, and that's mapped out also on the bottom of page two of the notes. Now, because the heart um, is constantly using oxygen, it's constantly beating, it doesn't really fatigue, it doesn't have to rest like skeletal muscle does, it has to have a lot of oxygen, so it has its own circulation. And the circulation starts from branches that come off the aorta, and those branches are the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. So those are the very first branches that come off the aorta right above the aortic semilunar valve. So you can see that the left coronary artery here is going to branch into two branches. You have the anterior interventricular artery, and that artery takes care of the anterior walls of the ventricles and the interventricular, interventricular septum. The circumflex artery serves the left atrium and posterior wall of the left ventricle. Then the right coronary artery is going to divide into what's called the posterior interventricular artery, which serves the posterior ventricular walls, and the right marginal branch, which is going to serve the lateral, left, uh, lateral side of the right side of the heart. So those are the major vessels that serve the um, heart muscle itself. Then on the returning trip, you have three vessels that are going to bring blood back into this larger uh, thin-walled structure that's called the um, coronary sinus. So you have the um, small cardiac vein, you have the anterior cardiac veins, and then you have the great cardiac veins, and they're all going to drain into um, they drain into the coronary sinus. And you also have what's called the middle cardiac vein, too. You can see they all come in together here. Now, a homeostatic imbalance um, associated with fleeting blood flow to the myocardium, angina pectoris, is the term given to the thoracic pain that's caused from this um, uh, very fleeting or slow delivery of blood to the myocardium. Now, the cells, aren't, the cells don't die here. They're weakened, and this results in pain uh, because they are oxygen-starved. Myocardial infarction refers to a complete blockage in that circulation to the heart muscle. And um, a prolonged coronary blockage can really be um, a very dangerous situation because the cells that are dependent upon that oxygen delivery can die. And if they die, um, they're not replaced. They're replaced with scar tissue. And over time, that can diminish the pumping ability of the heart muscle, and it becomes weakened. Now, the extrinsic innervation of the heart, this is the connection um, to the heart itself, is through the autonomic nervous system. So um, these cardiovascular centers that control the heart uh, pumping activity, these are in the medulla oblongata. Um, sympathetic connection actually can increase the rate and force of the heartbeat and the parasympathetic system is the one that kind of keeps it slowed down and regulates the um, vagal tone. This is the vagus nerve that's connected to the heart. And vagal tone itself will keep the heart rate between 60 and 80 beats per minute. The sympathetic system, that, the job of that system is to increase the heart rate during stress and activity. So the cardio acceleratory center the sympathetic response affects the SA. We haven't talked about these nodes yet. We'll get to this in the, in the next lecture. The SA node, the AV node, the heart muscle, the coronary arteries. Cardio inhibitory center, the parasympathetic response is inhibitory. It inhibits the AV, SA node, AV nodes, and it works by way of the vagus nerve. So sympathetic, stimulatory, um, parasympathetic is inhibitory. And that's where we're going to end this part of the lecture.